Hatev gives the name Davidian to all who follows his message, writing that the Adventist leadership who reject his message are like the ancient Israelite King Saul, while those who accept it are as King David, his successor. World War II is in full swing and Davidian ministerial students, unwilling to bear arms against fellow Christians, seek to be classed as conscientious objectors. Unable to attain this status from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Hatev forms the General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists and writes a tract called Military Stand, detailing the organization's reasons for seeking the non-combatant status. He structures his organization by writing a manual called the Leviticus and sets up an executive council, a board which functions as a governing body for the association. Hadif himself was viewed by the people as one who especially received inspiration from God, a prophet, and was the voice of authority at the headquarters. This old building was where we ate and cooked our food and, and had our bakery. And, uh, and it leaked quite a bit, so they put a lot of tar on the roof. And, uh, and so when it caught a fire at 5.30 in the morning, we was all coming from the camps, different places. Oh, I would say 50 to 70 people. We were so uh, scared and sad that our our brand new refrigerator that we waited for for two years or three was in there and our Hobart machine that made our bed, bread. And uh, so we was praying and this little place right here uh, was the only faucet we had. And uh, Brother Harder says, we're gonna stop right here. We'll kneel down on these rocks and ask God to save our refrigerator and, and our Hobart machine, because the rest of the building's not much. Anyway, uh, we all knelt down, he prayed. When we opened our eyes, there was only smoke, not fire. We were flabbergasted. I never will forget that. Uh, the followers that I've talked with who knew him, said we really admired him. He, he, was, he didn't put up with any foolishness. He was very strict and uh, demanding. But at the same time, he didn't like a lot of uh, people in this position uh, take on a lot of privileges, uh, financial or comfort or pleasure or what have you. In other words, they saw him as one, uh, one of the group, one of the gang. He was, he's, you know, dressed roughly, he uh, ate with the people, and so on and so forth. And then when he, uh, and so he was really respected for that. But, but he did have, he was authoritarian. He actually wrote a little constitution for the group. Um, and he was the president, and then there were other officers as well. And the other officers, if they were replaced, had to be approved by him. So it, it was very top down, you know, it was, he was in control things, but, uh, but he did win a lot of respect simply because he was uh, taking the, the lumps with everybody else in the Depression, I think, and uh, being one of, the, one of the gang, one of the group, you know, in that sense. According to the scripture, we find that 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 20 states that no scripture is of any private interpretation. And the part that is needed for us down here in the latter days was the book of Daniel, which was shut up to the time of the end, and the book of Revelation. And so he came as an interpreter to tell us what the beast in Daniel's prophecy, and the great image, and the things in the book of Revelation. He established himself really as the leader of this group, uh, as a kind of a recognized him as a prophet or somebody who speaks for God and that was really the source of his authority so from 1935 to 55 he was looked upon and looked upon himself as a kind of a new Elijah and uh, a new John the Baptist uh, sort of paving the way declaring the way for the coming of, of the Messiah so it's that kind of language that is used and why he had so much uh, authority
and in all of his teaching, he would say, well, it's, it's like unrolling a scroll that you haven't read. And uh, so we open up these new passages and, and uh, read those. So he says what he's doing is explaining. He's building on the prophets that have gone before. So Seventh-day Adventists actually came out of William Miller and Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, Miller said Christ is coming back in 1844. Uh, he had had the calculations based on numerology in the Bible. And of course that didn't occur. So Ellen White picked up the story and said, well, there was a really important thing that occurred at that time. And Jesus uh, in heaven did what the Adventists called investigating judgment. So he opened the book of life. These will be saved. These will not be saved. Um, and so, I mean, who's to say yes or no to that? It's, it's unprovable. It's, it, you know, you can't say one way or the other. But the people who followed her then believed that, and in a way she um, saved the um, Seventh-day Adventist Church for its future. So she's a, uh, really important as a prophetess in that denomination. So <clears throat> what the Davidians do is say, well, you know, there are these different stages, these different angels that give us uh, different bits of information as we go along. And so just as we had William Miller we had Ellen White, and then they will go back to all the way to Martin Luther, and they'll count six prophets. And so, well, here we are at the seventh, and this is the end of things. By now, Mount Carmel Center has grown. The Davidians have built a community that is centered on running the printing press and evangelism efforts. A school was erected for the children of the workers, a dormitory for laborers and visitors, a cafeteria, a nursing home for their elderly believers, and office buildings. The Davidians also maintained a peach orchard, a dairy, and even built a dam for Lake Waco. The Davidian work ethic inspired by Hadif himself hinged on principles of hard work, meticulous organization, and as Hadif put it, producing more than consuming. The community was partially self-sufficient, growing their own produce and selling it supporting local businesses, and even dispensing their own currency for trading purposes within the community. As far as what Mount Carmel was like, it was a regimen that we had a certain time we get up, certain time we had our, our meals. After that, I and the other students went to class to, uh, to our lunch time. And then after lunch, we went to work, like all the rest. And evening time, we did our are studying. And uh, we did that day after day, continuing on with the work that needed to be done. And during those three years, we had to go to class and we had our chance to speak on Friday night uh, to tell what we've learned and how we were learning the message. And we also went to Bailey University and took some classes there. We took a speech and and also um, radio, so we could learn how to talk and so on. And we took English. And it was during those times that I was there for those three years. Then go out into the community and work as carpenters, nurses, whatever skills they had in the Waco community. Some stayed there on the, uh, the property that they had. They uh, planted an orchard, they sold fruit off of the orchard. They planted other crops and so forth. They had also to run their own community, so they had a school, which was an alternative school there on the campus. And uh, at the school, it's interesting, their curriculum was one-third, three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, as we say. But then another third was a biblical instruction, which you would expect, and yet a third was practical kinds of uh, activities. So teach your kids how to sew, carpenter, and so on and so forth, so that they could have a source of income uh, so as a part of the training for their economy. We all had to work. Uh, the children had little paths to make with just lots of rocks. And uh, we would make rock walls for the people to go into these, they would uh, 
fix the, the paths and then we'd put the rocks you know, on either side. And that was our job when we were little. And, uh, and we would help out wherever we could. Brother Hodos, his way from the old country, children didn't just waste their time doing nothing. They accomplished something. And that's what his aim was, to help us children to want to work when we got older because you're not handed a meal ticket forever. You have to work for it when you get older and to pay your bills. And that's the only way you're going to be productive and not be a parasite or, and, uh, and expect somebody else to pay for what you are capable of doing. So that was his way of, of teaching us young people to love to work. They did manage to uh, make this thing work throughout the Depression, which I think was a pretty remarkable achievement. 